Ladies and gentlemen, this is a warning. Thank you. Sitting just north of Fort Myers, Florida, the city of Port Charlotte, like the rest of the state, was experiencing a population boom in the 1980s. In response, a number of new subdivisions were paved to make way for these new residents. But they overestimated that growth, which slowed down into the 90s. Today, there are still a number of paved road networks around the area that are surrounded by nothing but jungle. During the 90s, these roads were often used by hunters as a convenient way to get close to areas where wild animals roamed. But a hunter of another kind also found these areas convenient for disposing of his own prey. To date, over 20 skeletons of men have been found in these woods around Port Charlotte and Fort Myers. And though a suspect is behind bars, all but one of these murders remains unsolved. They are collectively known as the Hog Trail Murders goes on in San Francisco for the man known as the Zodiac Killer. There could be a serial killer in Chicago. The Oakland County child killer. Phantom killer. Frankfurt slasher. Four children have now been murdered. He has killed five and says he's going to kill again. Fifteen brutally murdered young women. The pattern is the same. One by one. The death count started rising. A man in a mask robbed, tied, and stabbed him. Strength stuck in burlap bags. It is highly unlikely that these women were murdered by separate Man. Where will the killer strike next? The police can't answer who or why. That's the question that we'll never know. I don't want to live the rest of my life wondering if this person's going to be caught. I believe that there's someone out there that has knowledge. And he's probably still at large. It was February 1st, 1994, when two delivery men became curious about a group of buzzards flying overhead the woods off these empty streets of a failed subdivision in Punta Gorda. The pair would discover the decaying corpse of a man who had been out there for at least a month. He had rope burns on his skin and his genitalia had been removed. Police found some pins in the bones from a surgery but could not trace them back to a particular hospital and with no identification, the case went cold. It was New Year's Day, 1996, when Wayne Brown let his dog out of his house here off of Ferrandina Street. Being another largely empty neighborhood, they let the dog run freely. And as dogs do, they bring things back for their masters. Over the past few weeks, the dog had been returning with bones to chew. But today, Wayne would be horrified to find his German short-haired pointer brought him back a human skull. Searching the woods, police would find the rest of a male skeleton, and like the body found two years earlier, they determined his genitalia had been removed, but yet again could not ID the body. It was March 7th that year when a motorcyclist pulled off of Route 75 and onto Laramie Circle about here to urinate. He had just gone past the tree line when he was shocked to find the nude corpse of a man. Lying face up in the shape of a cross, the man had been stabbed four times and his genitals removed. He had wounds indicating he had attempted to flee as well as rope burns on his arms. This is the wooded area where John Doe number three was discovered on March 7th of 1996. He was in the full canopy woods over here. Um, very remote area, has a curve in the road, dense vegetation along the roadside. And uh, the motorist who went in here to relieve himself had entered the woods here to go to the bathroom. And he was in here a short period of time when he smelled uh, foreign odor. He, pr he pretty much knew when they found, were finding bodies this far off the road that somebody wouldn't carry him this far in here. Florida is a very cruel state on human body. The high humidity, the heat insect infestation, it doesn't take long for a body to be completely stripped of its flesh, which is, from an investigator's standpoint, is, is a real handicap. Unlike the others, however, this body was estimated having been killed just 10 days prior, but it would not be until 1999 he was finally identified. Joseph Melaragno moved to Northport in 1995 when he was 35 with two women who were believed to have been prostitutes. 
Little else is known about him, and he was quietly buried with his grandparents back in Ohio after identification. Meanwhile, on April 17, 1996, two storm utility engineers were on break when they decided to check the local trails to hunt some hogs. Instead, they found a human skull. A lot of times we'll get calls of uh, remains and find that they're a hog or a dog or, or something like that. So um, we came out to investigate. We started doing a, a, just a general walkthrough search. And we found what turned out to be a, a human's head. If we had part of a body, we were probably going to find some more parts. And then not far from that, I discovered what was a pelvis. And it was obvious that uh, the body had been dismembered. I kind of looked around, and off in the distance, I saw something white or light-colored. Investigators from five different agencies converged on the location and would soon find something more shocking. I could see what looked like a hand upside down, just see the front of the fingers. And uh, at that point, I didn't know whether I had a, a body or whether I had a homeless person asleep under something. Inside a rolled-up piece of carpet padding was a male's body killed just one day prior. He too had rope burns and his genitals had been removed after he had been raped. All the more terrifying is both bodies were found in the same subdivision just a half a mile from where the first skeleton had been found in 1994. A task force was formed immediately following the latest discovery and sought help from larger agencies such as Miami. Uh, we all got together. There was 40 something of us on the task force and uh, that's when we all sat down and put our heads together and we went full bore on this thing to try to resolve it. The task force brought together over 50 officers from nine Florida law enforcement agencies to investigate the murders and to stop a serial killer. Just to give you an idea how thick this is back here, that right there, you can see it a little bit better there, that's the road. I can't be more than 25 feet off the road right here, and you're completely hidden. Basically, you could stay back here as long as you want. Nobody would probably hear you. Wouldn't hear anybody screaming or hollering or any conversations. And that right there, I'm no expert, but that might be hog tracks. Right through here. The skeleton would be identified as 25-year-old Kenneth Smith. But finally, with the identity of the corpse, officers had a lead. Twenty-one-year-old Richard Montgomery was last seen the night prior when he left his sister's home, saying he was going to make a few hundred dollars and would be back shortly. When she asked him if it was legal, he just smiled. Richard lived with his mother here in the Palms and Pines mobile home park, where neighbors described him as abusive toward her. His mother also told police he told her he was going to make some money, as well as telling her he made a new friend, a man named Daniel Conahan. Richard went to the Cox Lumberyard, now Builder's first source, where the two met and left together. Then, on May 8th, an inmate at the Glades Correctional Institute contacted police with information on the murders. David Allen Payton claimed that on March 5th, 1995, he had been trying to sober up by a bus stop when a man identifying himself as Daniel Conahan offered him a ride. Conahan gave Peyton more beer and Valium as they made their way down Zemmel Road, a dirt road between Fort Myers and Port Charlotte. Peyton claimed that Conahan was unsettling and turned down the offer to model nude for the man before his car got stuck in the mud on the side of the road. Conahan got out and tried to push the car when a truck stopped to help him out. Once free, Peyton, still drunk and high, sped off in the car, leaving Conahan behind, a crime for which he was currently in jail for. The task force gave him a lie detector test, and he passed. They now had a person of interest.
Daniel Conahan was an ex-Navy man who had been dishonorably discharged for repeated attempts to lure fellow sailors into a motel for gay sex. He would spend the next 13 years working around Chicago until he moved to Port Charlotte, Florida in 1993. Two years later, he would graduate at the top of his class in nursing school. Detectives placed an undercover officer on this busy corner of Kings Highway and US-41 posing as a panhandler. For two days in a row, Conahan stopped to talk to the man, but would not take the bait. Next, a week later, another detective was walking along the trails at the Port Charlotte Kiwanis Park when Conahan approached him. He followed the detective to the bathroom where he attempted to fillet him. While this showed he had a habit of picking up random men, it wasn't enough for prosecution. But one month later, another would-be victim came forward. It was August 15, 1994, when 26-year-old Stanley Burden stated a man named Dan picked him up at this restroom at Lions Park in Fort Myers. Stanley agreed to Dan's proposition to give him oral sex, and the two left this wooded area at the end of Edison Street. After posing for some photos, Stanley agreed to be tied up for some more bondage photography, but then things went sour. After unsuccessfully trying to rape him, the man tried strangling Stanley for 30 minutes before giving up and finally leaving him. Burden identified Daniel Conahan as the man who did this to him. Police now had enough to arrest him. Paint from Conahan's father's car that he drove matched a chip found on Richard Montgomery. Glove and rope fibers would also be collected that matched those found at the crime scene. Researching his credit card purchases showed that just north of Cox Lumber, Conahan stopped at this Walmart and purchased a package of clothesline, Polaroid film, pliers, and a utility knife. He then drove next door to a nation's bank located where this Bank of America now stands and withdrew $40 cash from the ATM. Finally, in 1999, Conahan would be convicted of the death of Richard Montgomery. Police stated they believed he was a suspect in the other murders but did not have enough evidence. But with the killer behind bars, the terror in western Florida was over, right? September 21st, 1996. Hog hunters found two more skeletons in nearby Inglewood, believed to have been there for six months to a year. Police stated they did not believe these were linked. May 22nd, 1997. A county worker discovered another skeleton in a wooded area near Quesada Avenue in Murdoch. One year later, it would be identified as 24-year-old landscaper William Patton. Patton had last been seen walking towards the Baron Collier Bridge in Port Charlotte with a cooler of beer in 1993. The bridge is less than a mile down the road from where the detective spoke to Conahan twice. One year later, transients found another set of remains within sight of where Patton was found. On November 28, 2001, a male skeleton was found by construction crews near US-41 in Charlotte Harbor. In 2002, another skeleton was found near the Charlotte County Landfill, which was located on Zemmel Road. Finally, things quieted down. Certainly, some of these skeletons could have been unrelated, such as the case of two remains found on Gasparilla Island in 2001 that turned out to be well over 100 years old. But there would be one more twist in the case of the Hog Trail killings. It was March 23, 2007, when a man was surveying this land off of Arcadia Street, which is in a small industrial area just about two miles from downtown Fort Myers. Today, a busted camera warns illegal dumpers that they will be fined, but over a decade ago, no such cameras existed here. Surveying the overgrown land for a new business, just 25 feet from this dirt road, the man found three human skeletons. Police would quickly begin a search and found five more in a 200-yard radius in what would become the largest homicide excavation in the state's history. 
Initially, it was suspected that they were remains from a former Fort Myers funeral home that had been closed down in 1994, and 28 bodies were discovered scattered about the property and warehouse, which were both within a few miles proximity to this site. But before long, they would instead be classified as homicides and earn the name of the Fort Myers Eight. Similarities to the Hog Trail killings were quickly pointed out by the press. Their deaths were placed somewhere between 1980 and 2000, their ages anywhere from 18 to 49. On March 23, 2017, eight sets of skeletal remains were found in a wooded area off Arcadia in the city of Fort Myers. In a case like this, identifying a victim is the first and most crucial piece of the investigation. We want to ask the public to come forward if they have a loved one who went missing during this time frame, even if they never reported it to the police. To make things more difficult, some of the skeletons had been left exposed for at least eight years, wearing down any helpful clues. The show, America's Most Wanted, featured the case and paid a forensic artist $10,000 to do facial reconstructions of all eight skulls. Eight months later, the first would be identified as Eric Kohler, a 21-year-old who had been reported missing in October 1995 after leaving his grandparents' home on this block of Winston Street in Port Charlotte. He was described as cognitively slow and had bounced between foster care, homelessness, and living as grandparents much of his life. That same month, police identified another victim as 38-year-old John Blevins who had disappeared in 1995 as well. Prior arrest reports note he was a prostitute who lived in a Fort Myers motel. Though the bus did not resemble his son, John's father decided to place a call and submit DNA. In 2008, a third would be identified as 24-year-old Jonathan Tihei. Tihei had gotten into drugs and crime at an early age after moving from Aurora, Illinois to Fort Myers. He would make regular phone calls to his mother and friends back home until going silent in October 1995. After that, the cases would go cold for a decade. 2018 saw them back in the limelight. First, news broke about some personal items of Conahan's being sold at an auction. Well, how would you like to buy the car of a serial killer? Daniel Conahan was found guilty of first-degree murder in the late 90s. He's been connected to more than a dozen similar crimes. NBC 2's Devin Turk is live right now in Charlotte County with how this website is selling murderers' memorabilia. And there's always somebody that's going to want to buy somebody else's stuff. William Harder, senior with Charles Manson, owns MurderAuction.com. It's like eBay for high crime memorabilia. I mean, and I understand that, yeah, this is maybe a far cry from stamps. It, it's no different. It's just a, it's a, it's collecting. Someone is using his site to sell the car Conahan used to lure his victims, as well as his wristwatch, playing cards, artwork, razor blade, and other personal items. While some feel it's not being sensitive to the victims, Harder says it's just a hobby for collectors. You know, let's say I sat down and wrote a book about Daniel Conahan detailing his crimes, and that would somehow be okay. But the minute, you know, I try to sell a letter from Daniel Conahan or God forbid his car, now I'm committing some sort of sin. I don't understand that. And Harder says that the seller got the items by being a pen pal with the killer. He says the killer shouldn't make any money off anything that is actually sold. Now, he was, he's in jail right now. He was sentenced to death back in 1999. Reporting live in Charlotte County, Devin Turk, NBC2. Then, Fort Myers police released some news on the Fort Myers 8. Well, tonight, new details in a more than a decade-old cold case. Law enforcement officials released new facial reconstructions of five of the eight skeletons found in the woods in Fort Myers. And investigators hope these new images will help to identify the people in the Bones case. Four in Corners, Alyssa Dicker reports. It's been 12 years since bones of eight men were found off Arcadia Street in Fort Myers. It's our hope that somebody out in the public will recognize um, a friend or a loved one or someone they grew up with. The Bones case gained national attention in 2008 after it aired on America's Most Wanted, which helped in identifying three of the victims. And technology has come a long way. These were the old sketches of the five remaining victims. Investigators are confident the new facial reconstructions will help put a crack in this case. The only real way to get these people identified outside of dental records or a DNA match would be somebody recognizing their faces. 
Three years later, Port Charlotte also updated their information. New technology is giving investigators another chance to identify the victim of a serial killer. The body discovered in the woods back in 1994 and all investigators could come up with was this clay model. Now, decades after the murder, investigators have a clear picture of what the victim likely looked like. On February 1st, 1994, hunters discovered a man's body in a wooded area off of 776. We walked in there and we saw and that was it. He was named John Doe number one. Detectives believe this unidentified man's death could be connected to the so-called hog trail killer. We have John Doe number one remains and we would like to be able to let his family know um, what happened to him. We don't believe that he is missing from the state of Florida. Detectives had the skull and bones re-examined by a forensic anthropologist at FGCU. Using that information, the Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office created this artist rendering of what the victim could have looked like. Detectives with the Charlotte County Sheriff's Office say they've identified the remains from a 27-year-old cold case. And those remains have been identified as Gerald Lombardi, uh, Lombard, and they now believe he was murdered by a serial killer. Back in 1994, this road used to be known as the Hog Trail. Now it's Wyandotte Avenue in Charlotte County. This is where Gerald Lombard's body was found by two hunters, but the remains couldn't be identified without modern DNA technology, so it took until this year to finally bring his family closure. Gerald Lombard's sister, Carol Lombard Dufresne, says after all this time, she and her husband Bob didn't think they would ever know what happened to her brother. And the last I spoke with him was in 1991. The Dufresnes quickly learned how much work it had taken to get to that phone call. Detectives took a tooth from Lombard's remains, recovered from the woods, and researchers were able to get a DNA profile. They then matched that with DNA Dufresne's sister had submitted to Ancestry.com. That. DNA that she had submitted uh, matched up to the DNA genealogy research that uh, the FBI did. Detectives also matched a picture developed from Lombard's skull to a real picture of him, and they could tell it was the same person. But now they also think they know how he died at the hands of Daniel Conahan. We're happy that we now know what happened to him, but it's sad. Meanwhile, detectives still have to prove their theory that Conahan was behind Lombard's death. Then, in 2022, investigators made yet another identification. Fort Myers police identify another victim of a suspected serial killer 15 years after eight skeletal remains were found in Fort Myers. They believe the Hog Trail serial killer murdered Robert Soden. He is now the fourth victim identified in this case. The, the researchers do a lot of detailed work. Work that led them back to 30-year-old Bobby Sodon, last spotted in 1995 right here in Fort Myers. We then tracked down direct family members and contacted them and were able to obtain a DNA sample from one of them that FDLE could do a direct comparison match. And they came back with this morning telling us that uh, the family member is a direct relation to our victim. And ultimately connecting Sodon right back to Daniel Conahan, AKA the hog trail killer. Sodon's body is number four of eight found on that same exact day in 2007 off of Arcadia Street. They managed to trace this individual's family back to their origins in uh, Holland and then they build it forward with whatever they can come up with. Sodon's family told investigators they thought he disappeared on his own. So this news is a lot to process. He led sort of a transient lifestyle. They thought he had wandered off and just didn't want to be found by anybody. Um, there is an amount of relief that they all have now, and now they can move toward closure on it. But for four other families, closure isn't the case just yet. Now, investigators tell me that they've already started the process of identifying a fifth body using the same exact process of DNA and a family tree link. Reporting in Fort Myers, Sarah Metz, NBC2. The four other men are still as of yet unidentified. While the four known skeletons all mirrored the victims of the hog trail killings, these four appear to have been average blue collared men. Some show signs of regular dental work and at least appear to have been healthy. Daniel Conahan is still incarcerated awaiting his death sentence to be carried out. 
he maintains his innocence in all of the murders. It is estimated that there were a total of 16 victims, but what's troubling is that some of the bones are estimated as having been killed sometime around 2001. And if this is the case, Conahan could not have been involved in those murders. Did he have an accomplice? Is someone else dumping men's bodies in the woods of Charlotte and Lee counties? And who knows just how many other remains lie within the woods along the hog trails. Developing tonight at 6, Charlotte County Sheriff's deputies confirmed they found a body in the woods today in Port Charlotte. At this point, our hope is to identify all of our victims, find family for them, and give them some closure on that. It's not like a traditional crime where, you know, you're in a house or whatever and you've got credit cards, you can find out who that is, you know, do associates, neighborhood checks, that type of thing. It doesn't work that way when you just get a body out in the woods. Investigators involved with the case will not give an official number of victims that they suspect Conahan killed, but the number has been unofficially estimated to be anywhere between 20 and 25. We're talking with a person that, that basically is going to keep killing unless we stop them. And that's the primary reason to get a passport. The situation we had, we had to get as many people as we could involved to prevent it from happening again. To have multiple bodies showing up, regardless of whether one person's doing it or more than one person's doing it, I'm not sure which one's more frightening, but certainly it was, it was a pretty nerve-wracking time for people who lived here. 